appreciate the uh, invitation to attend here, and uh, really excited to be with you. Um, you know, so I think that the title you first came up with was Silicon Valley versus Detroit, and yep. I was I was in Detroit you know, earlier in the week. Um, the the key thing really, it's not really a versus; it really is that collaboration. And really, I said, you know, it's these two different cultures, the two different <coughs> philosophies, really coming together is what what we're seeing. Um, what I'd like to do is um, just give you a real quick overview. I think large portion of the room is familiar with us, but you probably don't really know that much about us. Um, basically, the, we're a technology company. We've been around for 21 years now. So right, 20 years ago, we probably wouldn't have been suited to be uh, an automotive company. But we've been uh, engaged with the automotive industry for um, about 15 years now. Um, but again, you guys probably know us as, as a gaming company. We're a technology provider that, that goes into PCs for games. and. We were in the original Xbox and the Playstations, and we have our own gaming consoles now. So that's it's a huge business. It's a multi-billion dollar business a year for us. But what's cool is, I mean, gaming really drives so much of what you guys are involved in on the professional space. And so, you know, Stuart was talking about the design side. That's another huge business for us. So NVIDIA graphics processors are behind basically everything that goes on in that design world, all the virtual designing, the prototyping, the CD when you guys were downstairs, you saw the scanning. I mean, that's all NVIDIA 3D technology that's behind all that. Then we've also moved into really supercomputing, taking our GPUs, which are these massively parallel processors, and putting them into the data center, putting them into the cloud to power all sorts of things. You know, we were talking earlier about Shazam, right? The music identifying app. That runs on a GPU. So here you have an audio system running on a graphics processor because of the graphics horsepower that's behind it. Um, and really the, just the core compute that's required. And then what we do is we take our technology, we put it into whether it's chips or boards or servers, and then it comes to market through our OEM partners. So it could be an Apple, could be HP, could be Dell, or automakers. Um, and so really that's kind of the, the, the basis of our company. We're about 9,000 people, about $4.5 billion uh, in revenue. So kind of get back, you know, we started as a gaming company. Um, you know, part of that, I suppose, was automotive, right? You have people driving video games. And so this is, you know, state of the art 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's evolved quite a bit. You now look at what can be done in real time on a handheld device, essentially, um, state of the art from the racing simulator in a game where you have vehicle dynamics, you have, um, you know, particle simulations, you actually have simulation going on in addition to the rendering of the graphics. Um, so again, I think what we've seen is a huge evolution in something like gaming that really influences what goes on in other markets. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about Hollywood earlier and visual effects. You know, NVIDIA technology is used by all the studios, whether it's DreamWorks or Pixar, or Disney or ILM. And so this was from Life of Pi where this water is computer generated and the boat you know, is a 3D model. We apply surfaces and advanced rendering techniques to this. But even the other elements of the scene are all computer generated. And again, this is where kind of the state of the art of graphics is pushed in the entertainment industry. But the same technologies feed over right into automotive. Again, it's all about taking three dimensional data, whether you're building it from scratch, whether you're scanning it, uh, and being able to render that. And the goal for us then is to enable designers, whether they're automotive, designers, industrial engineers, or whoever it is, to really be able to be more creative, to have the right tools, and to be able to iterate on their designs to come up with better and safer and more efficient products. This was um, actually a still from a, a live demonstration we did. We had a huge conference last week called the GPU Technology Conference. It's basically how our graphics processor is utilized. This model from Honda has every single element in the car, down to the bolt defined. And what they're able to do is basically interactively slice through and see a photorealistic representation of that vehicle. And so from a design study, from an analysis perspective, and just from a whole overall concepting, um, this becomes a very valuable tool. Photorealism is a big part of what we do as well. So not just rendering something like some of that game stuff, didn't look so great. It's kind of fun to play, but it, we know that it's just animation. But in this design world, it's all about creating something that you cannot tell if it's real or not. 
So photorealism really requires a huge amount of computation because what's happening here is we're actually simulating how light behaves in the real world. Uh, there's a technique called ray tracing. It's basically you're tracing rays of light as they bounce through the scene, they reflect and refract off of different types of objects and materials, and that light comes back into your eye. And so essentially we do that for every pixel on the screen. And in some cases, you know, in the headlights or when you're going through glass, you basically have those light beams bouncing all over, and it just becomes a massive amount of computation. But imagine then how much time we can save designers when we give them the ability to visualize all these different materials, different color schemes, different design styles. Um, it really becomes a huge win for those designers and those students, like Stuart was talking about. And then simulation, is, again, is another area that we're heavily used now in the automotive world, whether it's doing some kind of traction control simulation, whether it's a virtual wind tunnel, whether it's a virtual crash test. Again, we give the engineering teams the ability to iterate on these designs to really help them understand the design of their car, the features, and that, all of that, how they all come together. Now, what I think is really cool is we're starting to see this come down to the consumer level. All this advanced rendering, we're now doing it in the cloud and letting consumers on their tablet actually see a photorealistic representation that they can interact with as they would design their vehicle. They can customize it. They can drag and drop and get a photorealistic rendered version of the car they want to build right there on their tablet. You can't do this on a normal tablet, but the fact this is happening in the cloud and all that advanced graphics is happening remotely and streaming down to your tablet, much like a Netflix movie does, um, makes this a reality. So again, kind of getting back to the topic, Silicon Valley. What's Silicon Valley all about? You know, it's about innovation. It's driving technology. Um, you know, we basically build computers, you know, from phones and tablets to laptops, PCs, workstations, servers now, and supercomputers. The world's fastest top 10 supercomputers that are the most efficient are using our GPUs. So we basically put a room this size full of like 16,000 of our graphics boards, pump on some air conditioning, put it right next to a power plant, but it will compute an incredible amount of um, performance that's used to solve just crazy science problems. This is kind of the spectrum of what we do. Now on the Detroit side, Detroit makes cars, right? And so what we're trying to do is figure out how do we leverage these technologies and bring this into a computer for the car. Really the best model though for this is this Titan supercomputer. This massively parallel processor um, is doing all kinds of things, the types of things that I talked about before. And so what we want to do is really shrink this down, and essentially that's what we've done, is we've merged this supercomputing technology with some mobile technologies to put together a computer that goes in the car. So there's actually a lot of car companies that are rolling this out. Audi is one of them. What we've done is then worked with them, and this is the, the box that goes inside the Audi. We make this module that you see that we're zooming in on. So this is our visual computing module. And much like a PC that has parts that you can pop in and upgrade, that's exactly what we've developed with Audi and also with BMW and with Tesla Motors. And so this module is a full computer system with a lot of other circuitry on it that is the heart of that car computer. And it's upgradable in that this module pops out and can, the newest one can slide into the box without having to redesign the whole system. Um, the newest A3 has the latest generation of this system from Audi. They just rolled it out about three weeks ago. They launched it in Silicon Valley because they wanted to highlight all the technology in the car. And, uh, and basically, it's delivering the latest capabilities. Now, it's not just about the hardware, though. There's a huge amount of software in this car, and it's, it's running different apps. Google Earth with Street View. You can actually get a full 360-degree panorama of your destination before you even start driving. Uh, we work with BMW, so the full top to bottom within BMW, but the whole BMW group, so it's coming out in Mini, it goes in the new i3 and i8, and Rolls-Royce. So again, the screens in the car are being driven by graphics processors, but they're really actual computers that are running an operating system and running applications as well. Um, Tesla, as I mentioned as well, has two of those visual computing modules, one for driving the all uh, digital instrument cluster, and one drives the 17-inch touchscreen. So it really is, again, it's
computer in the car. It's a computer that can get updated. And again, with connectivity, we're talking about over-the-air updates to the car. And a recent quote from, from Car and Drivers basically projecting, you know, if you take our newest processor, um, we're now seeing the power a variety of different features in the car from the cluster to the infotainment to rear seat entertainment to driver assistance systems. And if you'd have four processors per car in a two-car garage, you're now at the level of computing from the nation's fastest supercomputer from 1998 at a cost of $120 million. So obviously in technology, things evolve very quickly, but this example just shows how much horsepower from a processing perspective is ending up in the car. And well, why do we do this? Why do we need processors in the car? There's a lot of different things that we're seeing innovation in the marketplace demand. Um, you know, head-up displays, again, kinds of really cool visual experiences in the car, instrument clusters, large displays, 4K displays in the car, um, you know, natural language processing, where, again, you're thinking graphics, language, these are two very different things. But in reality, the parallel processing of a GPU is extremely well suited to do much better language processing than a CPU can or any of the systems today that are on your cell phone. Uh, and then the area that we're investing heavily in is advanced driver. They put more sensors on the cars, and then all the data that those sensors are generating need to be processed. Now, while um, I, I know what we're all here about also is, is sort of aftermarket. How do you customize the cars? And basically, I just wanted to touch on how we've developed a software solution that lets the studios, but potentially other people, change the interface on their vehicles and change the look and feel. So UI Composer Studio is a tool that anyone can download and play with on a PC. So it's a software authoring system that you have bring three-dimensional elements in and you create your gauges or your instrument cluster um, elements or your infotainment system. And then you can actually hook it into the CAN bus and it will render these graphics much like it would in a video game, but it's actually displaying your speed and the RPMs and you can have it you know, get information from your smartphone. So you could select you know, your music or your contacts. And it's just a great way to extend um, the look and feel or customize the look and feel of your vehicle. No, that's actually NVIDIA software. So the way it works is you do the rendering tool on your PC, and there's a runtime engine that runs in the car. Now, it runs on NVIDIA processors in the car. Um, but that system is basically then listening to the CAN bus and you've attached, it, it operates like Adobe software. You saw there was a timeline, right? And you'd, you basically would select uh, an element here um, and you'd say, okay, this is my speedometer. I'm going to attach that to the data feed for speed and the RPMs. And while the software is running, it's just responding to all that data, the, the fuel level, the battery, the temperature, whatever it is, as long as you basically in software wired those things up to the data um, it just renders it in real time. And so what, what, what I think is cool about this is, you know, I was out at a, a, in Detroit talking to some of the designers, and they were proud of the fact that they had created 400 screens in Photoshop to do all the different menu selections and everything else. Well, I said to them, well, what do you do if you want to change the font? Do you want to localize it to a different language or something? And they kind of scratched their head, and, oh, well, I guess we've got to go back into Photoshop 400 times and, and change these things. So something like this, is full, it's software. It's fully programmable. Okay, and again, as, as we were talking about materials earlier, um, this is all getting back to that rendering technology from the design side. Now what we're doing is we're bringing this into the car. So the ability to render photorealistic materials, copper, titanium, you know, plastic, carbon fiber, whatever it is, we have the ability now to let the world change the look and feel of their car. So this is just a real quick... Um, video showing though how you have this three-dimensional object that's the instrument cluster, how you can go in and select different materials and apply them to the different parts of the, uh, LM, the gauge and be able to see that and visualize it in the car. And I think if you look at what's happening in cars, we're seeing more and more screens, but there's been very little investment in making that experience look good. Right? A lot of it just looks like really basic graphics. And what we think is the ability to create just beautiful imagery in the car is just as important as all the effort that goes into the exterior design or the physical elements as well. You can see Audi um, is doing that. They just launched the 
um, the TT, or they just unveiled the TT in Geneva, and this is using um, our Tegra processor, which is our mobile automotive processor, to enable that. And they're actually adopting our technologies throughout um, for the clusters, for infotainment, for what they call smart display, which is an automotive grade tablet made by Audi, um, as well as now self-piloted cars. So we're talking about you know, Google and all that. Audi is actually putting into production a piloted car um, that is based on the next generation of the NVIDIA processor. And again, I'll close with uh, this little video clip showing it in use. So basically, there's other sensors on this vehicle. Now, what, what you notice here is you don't have the big Velodyne like the Google car. You don't have all these other sensors. It looks like a normal car. Um, there's multiple cameras all around. There's laser scanners. There's radar. It detects when the car is in a traffic jam. And what it does is it lets you basically opt in. You hit a button on the steering wheel, and now the car is in piloted mode. So you can take your hands off the wheel. You can take your feet off the pedals. And the car is going to stay in the lane. It will steer. It will maintain a safe dif distance to the car in front. It will stop and go up to a speed of 40 miles an hour. You're free to do whatever you want at that point. When the traffic dissipates, then the car alerts you. You have 10 seconds to take over control and continue on your way. <laughs> And if, if you don't, actually, if you don't take over control, it basically pulls over and stops. Will it maneuver if it gets set off? Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll stop. I mean, it'll, it'll hit the brakes if it needs to hit the brakes. Yep. Well, I mean, if a, when you have a lane merges, yeah. Lane yes. Yeah. So, again, I, I think, you know, just wrapping up, that really what's going to happen is there's going to be more need for computing in the car, whether it's cameras feeding data, whether it's um, creating better visual experiences, but the computing resources are going to increase. I think what we've seen is, in a lot of cases, car companies trying to do this themselves, or car companies buying a chip from a traditional chip supplier and trying to build a system on their own, and a lot of times didn't know what they didn't know, and the results were, were less than what they were hoping for. NVIDIA, as a computer company, is now partnering with a lot of car companies to really design that system. We work directly with the OEM um, to help build a complete system and to develop a system that can really be extensible. I think the key thing here now is we don't even know what a lot of the applications are that we're going to want to run on these cars next year, two years, three years. And a company like Tesla has shown that the ability to update that software over time really delights the owner of that car. That car gets better over time. And so with that, I'd like to thank you, and we'll turn it over.